All right, thank you. I know this is my first time in front of many of you, so I figured I would give you kind of one slide of introduction. I don't want to go too far into what I'm doing because I know many of you will be here tomorrow and I'm talking a little bit more broadly about research there. But my research is in empirical security and privacy, a lot of looking at the real world events that are taking place on the internet today. There's kind of been three major themes of this. One has been building systems to actually collect data about what's going on on the internet. A lot of this has been involved in internet-wide scanning, understanding how web servers, mail servers have been deployed, but it's also been a lot of working with industry groups to understand what they see in their data, working with groups like Google and Amazon and Cloudflare to look at the incoming connections to essentially understand what is going on on the internet. It's massively distributed, but oftentimes we need this kind of global perspective in order to make the right policy decisions, in order to understand errors that have been made in deployment and in order to understand how to build kind of the next generation of protocols and how they'll fit in with what's already out there. But actually, today I wanted to actually talk about an event that kind of, I think, sets the stage a little bit for today and kind of motivation around security. And I actually want to go back to October 21st, 2016. And this is a day that many of you may remember um, when a lot of these popular websites, Twitter and Amazon and PayPal, were unavailable, largely on the eastern seaboard, but also, also on the west coast, kind of all over the US. And these sites were unavailable on and off throughout the day. And this, of course, led to this kind of rampant speculation that the United States was under attack. This was another nation state trying to take down American infrastructure. This was you know, right before the election, and people were saying, this, this is a trial run. Um, so we got these kind of crazy, uh, different statements from everyone. And today I actually wanted to describe what actually happened, because it's actually kind of interesting. So what happened that day was that there was a massive denial of service attack against a large DNS provider called Dyn. Dyn is kind of one of those big plumbing companies on the internet that provided DNS for Twitter, for Amazon, for these other companies. It allowed you to do the lookup from domain to what were these groups IP addresses. And they came under a massive denial of service attack that day that essentially overloaded their network, overloaded a lot of their servers. And this was probably the first time we had seen an event kind of this, this size or of this scale. But it was actually the third event in a series of four that looked very different than the previous denial of service attacks we had seen on the internet. The first one actually happened in September of 2016, and it was an attack that hit the European hosting provider OVH. And then there was another one that hit a blog for Brian Krebs, a security blogger and researcher, later in September. And then in October, this first one hit Dyn. And that's when people really started to take notice that there was this large attacks. But these kind of four attacks looked very different from what we had seen before. And these, there were kind of two major differences. First was just the sheer magnitude of the attack. This DDoS attack that we saw against Dyn, that we saw against Krebs, was about twice as large of an attack that we had ever seen publicly documented before. So the attack was somewhere between 600 gigabits per second to a terabyte of traffic coming in. And beforehand, we had seen somewhere around 360 gigabits of traffic. And the second way it was different was that we had been very used to seeing distributed denial of service attacks that were amplified in the past. Someone would send, essentially spoof the source IP address of a client. They would send this to a DNS resolver, to an NTP server, to some sort of service that would amplify the request. And they would send that amplified request to the target victim. And this would mean that even if you only had one gigabit of bandwidth, you could still deliver quite a punch with a 60 to 70 times increase in the amount of data that you were sending. And this is what we had been seeing for quite a while in the DDoS space. But what hit these four attacks actually didn't use any amplification. There wasn't this 60 to 70 times increase in the traffic. In fact, it was all organic traffic. It was direct connections from hosts on the internet that were uh, sending Git requests, that were sending malformed router packets. There, but, but it was 600 gigabits of true traffic coming from devices. And what was also different was that the IP addresses we had seen in this attack were IP addresses we'd really never seen on the internet before. These were not normal client addresses. In fact, they were all IoT devices. They were the smallest devices 
on the internet. These were, these were web cameras and cable modems, and these devices that people deploy and don't think about. You don't even think that these even really have a CPU. They do. It has some small ARM processor or some small Intel processor. But the sheer magnitude of the number of these devices was able to take down and produce a much larger attack than we had ever seen on the internet. These devices that were part of this attack were all infected with a piece of malware called Mirai, which is actually what I want to talk about today. And Mirai was kind of the first major piece of malware that's targeted IoT devices. It's not necessarily the first, but it was the first that was really successful, that had this magnitude of attack pulled off. The malware itself is pretty simple. Uh, bots, once are infected, go out and they perform stateless scanning for other hosts to, to infect. And in the beginning, this was scanning for Telnet. They would search for different, any IPv4 address randomly that had port 23 open, and later on they added the second port, 2323, which we kind of call the IoT Telnet port, just because IoT devices thought they were adding security by, by changing the port slightly. And they scanned for these random hosts, and then they would attempt to log in with about five to 10 default usernames and passwords. And these were admin, like passwords like admin, admin, or root password. These were not ingenious combinations. These were, if you sat down and wrote five or 10 things on a paper, probably what you would write down. So these bots go off and they scan. They find other devices to infect. They report them all back to kind of a central C2 or command and control server. That server then says, um, essentially sends out a task to load malware on the machine. Uh, that, mal that, uh, that loader logs in, it deploys a binary that essentially takes over the machine, it kills some of the running processes, and it starts up and in it, uh, it converts that IoT device into a bot. And then that bot kind of takes over and starts to do its own thing, it starts to scan, it starts to look for other hosts to infect. And it kind of just sits there and waits. So during this process, the bot master is, is collecting bots to use. It's building its army. And these bots all sit there until they receive a signal that says, go off and attack. And I'll talk about a little later of who they attacked and why. But this looks a lot like the malware we had seen on desktop computers. But it was very specifically targeted towards IoT devices. So I mentioned. This wasn't the first piece of malware that went at IoT, but it was by far the most successful. And it was almost an accident that this, this, this was successful. The reason Mirai was so successful was that it was so stupidly simple. The authors actually really made pretty much every error you could make in a piece of malware. Their randomization algorithm actually didn't have full coverage over the IP space. They messed up the NDN NIST and IP addresses and blacklisted uh, what they thought was like the US post office, actually, but were actually just taking off the random last couple bits of IP addresses. Their, their loading service would drop packets. Uh, the code didn't really make sense. In the beginning, we were, we were fascinated by this because we all actually thought this was like an obfuscation kind of tactic. We thought that there was just something we were missing in this. And the answer was no, it was just, it was terrible. It looked like code that like a high school student had cobbled together and, and tried to run. Um, but it didn't take more than logging in was the username of admin and password to take over these devices. In fact, the reason it was so successful was because it was so simple. All they needed was a shell or a bash command, and they would run a couple bash processes, but that's what all of these devices had in common. All of these different devices from different manufacturers might have had the username admin and the password admin, but because they didn't try to go after any vulnerabilities that were specific to devices, they were able just to kind of take this shotgun approach, and they had no idea what they were gonna take over. Um, I think it was probably just as much a surprise to them as it was to us of who they actually were able to infect. But it was the simplicity that really led to the success in this, in this ecosystem. So the authors took these existing uh, pieces of malware and essentially dumbed them down 
and added a little bit more statelessness, and they were able to take over hundreds of thousands of devices with it. So that's kind of the background of what Mirai was, but what actually happened in October. I and mean, I think this is what's actually a little bit more interesting. And the first question I think is a pretty simple one. How large was Mirai? How many bots did it actually take over? And the news sources had numbers all over the place. We saw numbers from a half million to a million to millions. Um, and a lot of those were pretty exaggerated because a lot of these hosts were in space where there was just a lot of churn. And so a lot of these, these hosts were being double counted. But we were actually able to track pretty specifically the size of the botnet because it scanned using this kind of bizarre hacked together approach that was actually very fingerprintable from the outside. They took static values and they put them in all the fields that should have been random, like your IP ID and your TCP sequence number. And you have several of these fields where you usually have 32 bits of entropy, but they just use the same value in each of them. So if you watched the traffic that you saw coming into a large network, it was pretty obvious what machines were part of Mirai. We actually saw the first scan on August 1st, 2016. Um, there, this actually isn't an IoT device. It was a server that was rented out of a hosting provider in New Jersey um, that was like a, a kind of a bulletproof hosting provider named Data Wagon. And they scanned for about two hours. And you can kind of see this, the beginning of what's going on. Then after two hours, they stop. And then we start to see the botnet emerge. So what happened was this person essentially ran a scan from a host they controlled. They found a list of initial IP addresses to go after. Then they went and loaded malware on them. And then they said, OK, all of my bots go forth and look for more victims. So within the first minute of the botnet starting, um, there are about 800 devices infected. This raised to about 11,000 in about 10 minutes. Um, and then it continues to grow. By the end of the first day, about 24 hours, there's about 65,000 hosts that have been infected and are going out and scanning. And again, this is just based on logging in with default usernames and passwords. I think there's five hard-coded in the initial malware. And we see this kind of, it's, it remains small in the beginning, and then we see a couple large jumps. The first big jump, you kind of see where the green uh, appears, is where they started to also scan for part 2323 instead of just pure Telnet. And then you see another large jump kind of right at the beginning of December where they started to scan for a protocol called CWMP, or customer, uh, it, it's, a, it's a protocol that lets essentially ISPs control cable modems on their networks. Um, so actually, this giant hop like right here is like three ISPs or so that just had default usernames and passwords, had vulnerable cable modems in this space. Uh, and then you see that the ISP notices this that all of a sudden their entire ISP doesn't work, uh, and it's just scanning. And they patch, and then you can kind of see this decay as, as folks restart their modems, that they come back and take on their normal kind of activity. So at the peak here in December, there's about 600,000 hosts that are infected. But the steady state kind of stayed somewhere between 200 and 300,000 hosts. Um, and then you'll notice kind of towards the end it starts to to decrease, and that's not good news, actually. Um, uh, I'll come back to that a little bit later. So Mirai takes over 600,000 of these IoT devices, and it's capable of producing about 600 gigabits of DDoS traffic, taking down these pretty large providers. What did Mirai actually take over? Um, we can actually look at this because most of these devices that you could log in over Telnet also had web interfaces that actually very helpfully tell you exactly what they are. It might even be the Telnet prompt that says, hey, you're logging into a Netgear router, or you're logging into this camera. Um, but we can go through and we can pull out, using internet-wide scanning, what all the websites and all these devices looked like at the time that they were taken over. And from that, we can start to understand what these actually were. And they truly are IoT devices. We actually see very few devices that were desktop computers or anything like that. The vast majority were home routers. They were cameras and DVRs. They were NASes, like network-attached storage devices. Really, 
they were kind of all over the place. It was just happened to be where they saw the passwords that matched up. And if you actually look at the passwords that you guess, some of them are specific enough that we can track them back to a specific uh, creator or manufacturers. In other cases, when the password's one, two, three, four, five, um, don't really know who they're targeting. Um, that password is used across a number of manufacturers. But you start to see patterns among the types of devices that these are going after. So I mentioned in the beginning that these are the four kind of large attacks. There was OVH, there was Brian Krebs, there was Dyne. But those are really kind of the top four because they grabbed our attention. By deploying honeypots and actually watching the commands that came in to these bots, we could actually tell who they were going after. And it's kind of an eclectic list. Um, you might be saying to yourself, what do these websites really have in common? You have quite literally cooking blogs, um, and then you also have Dyne, who's a major, major provider on the internet. What, what, what do these all have in common? And the answer is actually pretty much nothing. And the reason for that is that on September 30th, um, kind of in an underground hacking forum, there was this post where the author of Mirai essentially said, here's the malware. Everyone go at it. And this wasn't necessarily uh, an act of, uh, of goodwill on his part. Um, it's actually a fairly known kind of tactic of if you believe um, you're being uh, that, that the police are starting to find who you are. One way of getting rid of the evidence is giving it to everyone. And so then all of a sudden, every researcher has it. Every, every nefarious actor has a copy of this malware. And when this happened, Mirai started to evolve. So it started as this very dumb piece of malware that scanned five usernames and passwords. But the moment it went into the forums, people started to add features. And this is where you see things like all of a sudden there's this giant spike of the CWMP hosts is because one variant decided they would add one vulnerability. They would start to add to scan for another type of, of device, that they would add different, um, different protocols, different passwords, different ranges that they block, uh, different tactics for how they would prevent the device from being infected in the future. And what was really interesting is we actually saw essentially like the last 10 years of malware evolution occur over the process of, or the, the span of a couple weeks. So we've had this long history of desktop malware getting smarter and smarter, starting to use domain generation algorithms, starting to remove other viruses that are on that machine so that you have full control. And we saw the exact same thing happen once this was released. So we went from this really dumb piece of malware within a couple of weeks to essentially a pretty sophisticated looking piece of malware. And that actually starts to lead into why we saw this kind of downward slope. But as this happened, the other thing that happened was that you all of a sudden now had different factions that were controlling different parts of the botnet. And they actually started to fight each other. Um, so when you actually look at who was being attacked, what you'd notice would be that in one of the clusters, they would be attacking the command and control servers of another cluster. Because the, the idea was if that, that command and control server went down, you could take over its bots. That they'd eventually reboot and try to find a new master, and you would take them over. And so there's this large evolution. But in the end, there ended up being a couple of very large clusters. And what I have up here on the screen essentially is a clustering of the command and control infrastructure associated with different clusters. So we go in and we look at all the DNS names and the IP addresses and the ownership of these different resources at ISPs, at these DNS providers. And we're able to link these together by saying, these three names point to this IP address. One of them migrated over to another IP address. We can start to piece together the story. But this also starts to tell a story of why did we see such a weird range of websites being attacked? 
So the first cluster that you see, this green one, is actually the original one. It's the one that went after Brian Krebs. It's the one that went over OVH. You see cluster two, which is, looks like the largest, which actually is uh, what we call a booter service. Essentially, the, the owners of that put up a website, and they would say, if you give me a Bitcoin, I will DOS your enemy. And there's actually this full marketplace. You can go and you can actually bid and say, this is how much Bitcoin or how much other money I want to spend on this attack. And then you'll say, I want to purchase one hour of DDoS um, against my, my competitor's cooking blog. And there's been a large ecosystem of this in kind of the, the, the amplification space. But we, again, saw the same thing emerge here in the, in the IoT space. There still isn't necessarily an obvious question, like answer of why attack both Brian Krebs and Dyn and OVH? Like why, why go after these large, these large hosting providers? Um, and, and why, if you can't put together code, do you think I'm going to go after one of the largest DNS providers in the country? And the actual answer is Minecraft, actually. Um, one of the reasons that these denial of service kind of groups come up is that there's a lot of money to be made running a Minecraft server. And it's very easy to get folks to move over to another Minecraft server. It's not like you have to move all your infrastructure from EC2 to Google Cloud or something like that. Gamers say, this server's down. As long as all of us move to the same other provider, let's move. And so this is being used, was using for blackmail um, they were actually extorting the owners of very large Minecraft servers on OVH. Um, for Dyn, it was actually going after PlayStation servers. Dyn hosts the authoritative DNS records for PlayStation. And so while what we see from the outside looks like an attack that's going after Dyn as a whole, the fact that Dyn went down was actually just an unfortunate circumstance. These attackers are really just going after uh, these PlayStation servers. Um, and if you, if you DOS correctly, you, can, you, can, you have an advantage in this game um, because your other, the other players don't know if this is coming. They can't time their moves. And it had nothing to do with an attack beyond just going after a couple of these servers. For Brian Krebs, um, they were actually just pissed at him. Um, they were really upset that he had written an article that kind of uh, had uh, uncovered a similar booter operation, and it was run by their friends. And they decided to go after him for this. Uh, and that retribution was the largest attack we had seen on the internet. But again, it was they were annoyed their friend had been, had been arrested because of an article that Brian had written. Like, that's where we are. We took down the large like, DNS provider because a couple of folks are really upset about a blog post. That's where we are in the IoT space right now. So who are these people? Um, as I mentioned, <laughs> the authors of the, this did some really stupid, stupid things. And we actually know who did it. Um, they were actually arrested in the end of 2017. Um, these were a couple of college students. They were undergrads. Um, they had started a business operation where they would blackmail the owners of, of these Minecraft servers. That was their business. They, were, they would send someone an email saying, if you don't move over to our superior DDoS protection service, your website's going to go offline. Really, they just wouldn't DOS them if, if they paid up. And this just spiraled, and others uh, took control once they had released the malware and started to build on top of it. Mariah has a somewhat ironic name, or maybe it's depressing, I don't know, of the future. Um, and I don't know if this was, necessarily know what the authors meant when they named this this, um, but it does kind of raise this interesting question of, 
this likely is kind of the future unless we start to clean up this act. Um, and it's not just policy. Most of these devices actually were not in the United States. Most of them were actually in, uh, I, can, I don't have this slide, but I can pull it up. Um, uh, there's this bias here. Actually, you can't see this, can you? Uh, let's see. Um, if I can show this to you. Most of these devices were not in the United States. Um, these were in regions that we didn't really consider having significant amounts of bandwidth. They were in South America. They were in Southeast Asia. Um, and the reason that this malware looked to kind of tail off at the end isn't that these devices have been patched. It's actually that the malware has gotten more sophisticated, that new botnets have taken over, and they are using much harder to detect uh, methods of, of taking over the other hosts. They're starting to use uh, attacks that aren't just usernames and passwords guessing. And we haven't really seen attacks from these new, mal these new pieces of malware, from these new botnets that are taken over from Mirai, but we do know that they are slowly ramping up in size. And they are capable of, of starting these attacks that, I mean, as part of this, Akamai said to Brian Krebs, you, got, you have to move off. This is affecting our production network. Um, that there's only a couple providers in the world that can actually withstand the attacks that are now possible from these IoT devices, from this, this kind of uh, lack of, of attention and to the security and this kind of rush to the bottom to get these devices out and deployed. The work uh, presented here was part of a very large team across industry, across uh, uh, law enforcement, uh, and as well as academic users, uh, to look at the traffic that was actually seen at Dyn, seen at Akamai, seen at Google, to look at the DNS infrastructure behind these attacks. Um, but there is a paper out there, if this is of interest to other folks, to kind of understand more in depth what was going on. And with that, I'll take any questions. Um, so uh, IPv6 to me is two to the 96 times larger. Um, this is actually a very interesting academic research question to me is how do you scan IPv6? How do you understand these devices? It's not possible to just brute force. That's not going to work. Um, you have to have a much more intelligent kind of plan, uh, a more alg algorithmic approach where you look at what devices have been deployed. Can you detect what addressing schemes have been used in different regions. So maybe you look at DNS, DNS records and you see that these are, are a certain offset apart between the IPs they give hosts. And from there, you can start to learn and understand how you should use different regions. Um, I don't think we'll necessarily get to the fully comprehensive kind of scan that we saw for Mirai or we've seen for, for tools like ZMAP. But I do think we will see effective IPv6 solutions. Actually, I have to ask before, the, the, this is a question that must be on people's minds, which yeah. is what do we do to prevent these kind of things? To prevent these? Um, I mean, the bar here, I think, for IoT is low in many ways from the security perspective. These weren't genius attacks. Um, these were usernames and passwords. And I think the question is how do we enable these manufacturers to build secure devices by default. How, um, and this is where I think like, the work with POC, for example, is really interesting of, can we build these primitives that enable people to be faster and also to be more secure at the same time so that they're incentivized to do the right thing? Yeah. What, can we do in terms, what can we do in terms of internet architecture and infrastructure to deal with this? Mm -hmm. Is every packet going to need a passport to cross an international border? It gets tough when you add that, that international <laughs> part at the end. Um, in the amplification space, there are simple things to be done. Um, a lot of this can be, uh, can be handled by doing egress filtering correctly. Um, in this space, it's not immediately obvious what to do because these aren't devices that are sending a lot of bandwidth. It's very hard to detect uh, that 
this is an attack when each device has such a small amount. Um, there have been a lot of proposals uh, in this space, but it's unclear right now what we do that actually works with kind of how the internet is currently deployed. And so there's many kind of theoretical ideas out there of ways to solve this, but I haven't seen really tractable solutions today that we can deploy. Or, or, or similar uh, works to be practical and, and, and relevant to this at all? So I didn't catch the first half of your question. So frameworks like Vanadium, decentralized authorization you know, for IoT, are they practical? Are they, do they have any promise? Or... Um, there's, there's technical practicality, and there's also kind of this like real world, can we get actually manufacturers to use, to use this? And I think that second part is where this is really tough, where how do we actually convince manufacturers that they should be taking these steps when it doesn't allow them to sell more products or to, to, uh, to more quickly deploy products. And so that's where I really think you have to have this kind of other side of this to make jobs easier in order to kind of incentivize people to use these technical solutions. Okay, thank you very much for, for using Japanese words, uh, senpai <laughs> and mirai, okay, I'm Japanese. Oh, well, I, I can't okay. take credit for that. <laughs> My question will be this, this. okay. Uh, every every uh, IoT device should have a com computer that processes a cri cryptograph. What do you think? I'm not sure if I understand. Computer, uh, IoT devices should have a, a computer that process the cryptogram. Yes. Um, That's a very important question. I absolutely agree that needs to be there. The thing that happened was that you all of a sudden now had different factions that were controlling different parts of the botnet. And they actually started to fight each other. Um, so when you actually look at who was being attacked, what you'd notice would be that in one of the clusters, they would be attacking the command and control servers of another cluster. Because the, the idea was if that, that command and control server went down, you could take over its bots. That they'd eventually reboot and try to find a new master, and you would take them over. And so there's this large evolution. But in the end, there ended up being a couple of very large clusters. And what I have up here on the screen essentially is a clustering of the command and control infrastructure associated with different clusters. So we go in and we look at all the DNS names and the IP addresses and the ownership of these different resources at ISPs, at these DNS providers, and we're able to link these together by saying, these three names point to this IP address, one of them migrated over to another IP address. We can start to piece together the story. But this also starts to tell a story of why did we see such a weird range of websites being attacked? So the first cluster that you see, this green one, is actually the original one. It's the one that went after Brian Krebs. It's the one that went over OVH. You see cluster two, which is, looks like the largest, which actually is uh, what we call a booter service. Essentially, the, the owners of that put up a website, and they would say, if you give me a Bitcoin, I will DOS your enemy. And there's actually this full marketplace. You can go in, you can actually bid and say, this is how much Bitcoin or how much other money I want to spend on this attack. And then you'll say, I want to purchase one hour of DDoS um, against my, my competitor's cooking blog. And there's been a large ecosystem of this in kind of the, the, the amplification space. But we, again, saw the same thing emerge here in the in the IoT space. There still isn't necessarily an obvious question, like answer of why attack both Brian Krebs and Dyn and OVH? Like why, why go after these large, these large hosting providers? Um, and, and why, if you can't put together code, do you think I'm gonna go after one of the largest DNS providers in the country? And the actual answer is Minecraft, actually. Um, one of the reasons that these denial of service kind of 
groups come up is that there's a lot of money to be made running a Minecraft server. And it's very easy to get folks to move over to another Minecraft server. It's not like you have to move all your infrastructure from EC2 to Google Cloud or something like that. Gamers say, this server's down. As long as all of us move to the same other provider, let's move. And so this is being used, was using for blackmail. Um, they were actually extorting the owners of very large Minecraft servers on OVH. Um, for Dyn, it was actually going after PlayStation servers. Dyn hosts the authoritative DNS records for PlayStation. And so while what we see from the outside looks like an attack that's going after Dyn as a whole, the fact that Dyn went down was actually just an unfortunate circumstance. These attackers were really just going after uh, these PlayStation servers. Um, and if you, if you DOS correctly, you, can, you, can, you have an advantage in this game um, because your other, the other players don't know if this is coming. They can't time their moves. And it had nothing to do with an attack beyond just going after a couple of these servers. For Brian Krebs, um, they were actually just pissed at him. Um, they were really upset that he had written an article that kind of uh, had uh, uncovered a similar booter operation, and it was run by their friends. And they decided to go after him for this. Uh, and that retribution was the largest attack we had seen on the internet. But again, it was they were annoyed their friend had been, had been arrested because of an article that Brian had written. Like, that's where we are. We took down the large like, DNS provider because a couple of folks are really upset about a blog post. That's where we are in the IoT space right now. So who are these people? Um, as I mentioned, <laughs> the authors of the, this did some really stupid, stupid things. And we actually know who did it. Um, they were actually arrested in the end of 2017. Um, these were a couple of college students. They were undergrads. Um, they had started a business operation where they would blackmail the owners of, of these Minecraft servers. That was their business. They, were, they would send someone an email saying, if you don't move over to our superior DDoS protection service, your website's going to go offline. Really, they just wouldn't DOS them if, if they paid up. And this just spiraled, and others uh, took control once they had released the malware and started to build on top of it. Mariah has a somewhat ironic name, or maybe it's depressing, I don't know, of the future. Um, and I don't know if this was, necessarily know what the authors meant when they named this this. Um, but it does kind of raise this interesting question of, this likely is kind of the future unless we start to clean up this act. Um, and it's not just policy. Most of these devices actually were not in the United States. Most of them were actually in, uh, I, can, I don't have this slide, but I can pull it up. Um, uh, there's this bias here. Actually, you can't see this, can you? Uh, let's see. Um, if I can show this to you. Most of these devices were not in the United States. Um, these were in regions that we didn't really consider having significant amounts of bandwidth. They were in South America. They were in Southeast Asia. Um, and the reason that this malware looked to kind of tail off at the end isn't that these devices have been patched. It's actually that the malware has gotten more sophisticated, that new botnets have taken over, and they are using much harder to detect uh, methods of, of taking over the other hosts. They're starting to use uh, attacks that aren't just usernames and passwords guessing. And we haven't really seen attacks from these new, mal these new pieces of malware, from these new botnets that are taken over from Mirai. But we do know that they are slowly ramping up in size. And they are capable of, of starting these attacks that, I mean, as part of this, Akamai said to Brian Krebs, you, got, you have to move off. This is affecting our production network. 
um, that there's only a couple providers in the world that can actually withstand the attacks that are now possible from these IoT devices, from this, this kind of uh, lack of, of attention into the security and this kind of rush to the bottom to get these devices out and deployed. The work uh, presented here was part of a very large team across industry, across uh, uh, law enforcement, uh, and as well as academic users, uh, to look at the traffic that was actually seen at Dyn, seen at Akamai, seen at Google, to look at the DNS infrastructure behind these attacks. Um, but there is a paper out there, if this is of interest to other folks, to kind of understand more in depth what was going on. And with that, I'll take any questions. Um, so uh, IPv6 to me is two to the 96 times larger. Um, this is actually a very interesting academic research question to me is how do you scan IPv6? How do you understand these devices? It's not possible to just brute force. That's not going to work. Um, you have to have a much more intelligent kind of plan, uh, a more alg algorithmic approach where you look at what devices have been deployed. Can you detect what addressing schemes have been used in different regions. So maybe you look at DNS, DNS records and you see that these are, are a certain offset apart between the IPs they give hosts. And from there, you can start to learn and understand how you should use different regions. Um, I don't think we'll necessarily get to the fully comprehensive kind of scan that we saw for Mirai or we've seen for, for tools like ZMAP, but I do think we will see effective IPv6 solutions. Actually, I have to ask before, this is a question that must be on people's minds, which yeah. is what do we do to prevent these kind of things? To prevent these? Um, I mean, the bar here, I think, for IoT is low in many ways from the security perspective. These weren't genius attacks. Um, these were usernames and passwords. And I think the question is how do we enable these manufacturers to build secure devices by default. How, um, and this is where I think like, the work with POC, for example, is really interesting of, can we build these primitives that enable people to be faster and also to be more secure at the same time so that they're incentivized to do the right thing? Yeah. What, can we do in terms, what can we do in terms of internet architecture and infrastructure to deal with this? Mm -hmm. Is every packet going to need a passport to cross an international border? It gets tough when you add that, that international <laughs> part at the end. Um, in the amplification space, there are simple things to be done. Um, a lot of this can be, uh, can be handled by doing egress filtering correctly. Um, in this space, it's not immediately obvious what to do because these aren't devices that are sending a lot of bandwidth. It's very hard to detect uh, that this is an attack when each device has such a small amount. Um, there have been a lot of proposals uh, in this space, but it's unclear right now what we do that actually works with kind of how the internet is currently deployed. And so there's many kind of theoretical ideas out there of ways to solve this, but I haven't seen really tractable solutions today that we can deploy. Uh, or, or, or similar uh, works to be practical and, and, and relevant to this at all? So I didn't catch the first half of your question. So frameworks like Vanadium, decentralized authorization, you know, for IoT, are they practical? Are they, do they have any promise? Or? Um, there's, there's technical practicality, and there's also kind of this like real world, can we get actually manufacturers to use, that, use this? And I think that second part is where this is really tough, where how do we actually convince manufacturers that they should be taking these steps when it doesn't allow them to sell more products or to, to, uh, to more quickly deploy products? And so that's where I really think you have to have this kind of other side of this to make jobs easier in order to kind of incentivize people to use these technical solutions.
Okay, thank you very much for using Japanese words as <laughs> senpai and mirai. Okay, I'm Japanese. <laughs> well, I, I can't okay. take credit for that. <laughs> My question will be this. this. Okay. Uh, every every uh, IoT device should have the com computer that processes a cri cryptograph. What do you think? I'm not sure if I understand. Computer, uh, IoT devices should have a computer that process the cryptograph. Yes. Um, That's a very important question. I absolutely agree that needs to be there. Um, I think in, in some ways it's, it's a little bit orthogonal to this. I um, mean, you can have very good secure communication still be um, vulnerable to these types of attacks. I think it's, again, it's kind of a question of how do you bring this all together to, to really make it, make people want to deploy it. I'm, at that time, probably uh, de depending, on, depending on computers, but the computer should be uh, smaller, smaller, smaller. But, uh, right, uh, right. And I, I mean, that's what I think that, that's coming back to this is the future is, this really is the start. Um, I mean, in many ways, we say IoT is pervasive, but I think we're really at just kind of the tip of this iceberg. And that's both uh, a pro and a con. Um, I, I think it, it means that we are in kind of a time and a space where we can kind of mold where this goes. But at the same time, it's very evident that we have to, that we have to come up with effective solutions or this is going to become a much larger problem. Cool. All right. Well, great. Thanks. Great. Excellent questions. Thanks, Akira.